All right. Well, good morning. We have the Canvas web page up, and it's it's been a little bit of a of a different um, deal. Let's see. I'm getting everybody admitted to our meeting. There we go. Awesome. I believe JJ is having some troubles with the um, link in the email. Okay. Um, let's see. If oh, thank God I made it. You made it. You made it, JJ. Welcome. It's good. It's good to have you here. So, yep, I see you on there. We got Jeremiah and Lucas and Nathan. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, yeah. We will uh, get going. Okay. Um, so, with that, uh, I have our Canvas webpage up, and it's really good to have you guys back with us, especially because we've had. Uh, spring break and and I don't know normally in a normal situation you lose some students over spring break this is definitely not normal um, so yeah, my, it's good my to geography have professor friggin dropped an exam during spring break I was pissed I was about to drop that class he, he gave you an exam during spring break it's almost like I don't know like people don't know what time it is I mean I have fallen victim of thinking it was one day and it was another day or trying to attend a webinar and I thought it was at one time and it was East Coast time so I was off by an hour or two hours so uh, it was anyways, a cool webinar. speaking about uh, schedules let's go in to our schedule right now and I have some stuff loaded up on the calendar so I'm going to click that the internet's thinking about opening it up for me there we go um so um here is is what we got um uh we are on the 17th today i i put up each lecture that we'll have so today we're going to be talking about camshafts and induction systems with basically cams and intakes next week we're going to do exhausts and transition into EFI. The week after that, we'll be really diving into EFI tuning. And then if I go to um, go to May, we're going to finish things off with our power adders, which will be turbo supergargers and nitrous, uh, and then kind of do a big review. I also have some notes on breaking in a new engine. Um, and then I have a couple of tests for you. One will, one is, is kind of sort of like, not necessarily a midterm, but it's, it's a general knowledge. And I'm gonna open that up on the first, cause there's a few more things I need to cover before we get into it. Um, and then I'm also gonna give you guys an opportunity to take the um, EFI University uh, exam. Uh, so you can see how, how that, how, easy or difficult for you that thing is. And it's it's gonna be one of those things where uh, that exam's more of a, 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 a completion experiment than than what your actual grade is, because there is some, some hard stuff on that. So, and with that, if you stick with me here, you will end up, uh, you'll get your full credits for this class. Now, why Great. is that uh, important? Because I wanted you guys to have credit for doing you know doing the course and not just end up with with nothing like for for many of the students and many of the regular automotive classes what happened was that they um basically did you know two thirds uh, not two thirds about 40 percent of the class up through the end of march and didn't get credit for anything because the way the classes were canceled out and i figured i'd rather you guys have credit uh than no credit I actually had a question about that for yeah. me and Charlie, since we are one of the exceptions in that. Do you know if we'll get an actual grade for the engine repair? Uh, what you're going to get is either, I got the whiteboard up. Hey, can you guys see the whiteboard? Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, you're either going to get an incomplete or you might get... Um, an EW. 
Well, either, I mean, I mean, in either case, it doesn't matter what what your team is going to do, Nathan. Your team is going to meet with me next semester, and next semester in the fall, I'm going to be teaching skill and speed, which is AT 140. And so you guys can meet with me and we can do a petition. Um, and that petition will allow you to uh, get credit for the engine class. So we'll, we'll fix that and make, and make that right. And will that credit other, count towards a degree? Yeah, it'll be just okay. like you took the engine class like normal, okay? Um, and I have other students. So part of the reason why I'll be teaching AT140 or skill and speed in the fall um, is to allow students the ability to meet with me and because I'm the department chair, I can do petitions and some of those different things to allow people to receive credits. Um, that being said, speaking about the fall schedule. So would I have to enroll in AT140 again? Uh, no, you don't have to enroll in, um, in AT140 um, again. You could just come, come see me during that time, or you could enroll it in it again if, if you wanted to. If you have projects and things to work on, oops. If you have projects and things that you wanted to work on, then um, that would be a good idea. All right, so. You can take 140 multiple times. You can take it four times. All right, so let me make sure I'm sharing my screen. I thought I was. Hang on a sec. There we How go. come McCormack isn't teaching it this? Um, and yeah, so that's a good question. So remember I said it's twofold. Uh, John McCormack has become the dean of the interim dean of apprenticeship. So he, so with that position, he can't teach any automotive classes. He's, he's off the auto map. And um, with that, so I have, I have the schedule up just so you can see a calendar. Um, I want to say that school will start somewhere around the um, 20th or so is where we normally, normally start here. Um, Oops. Hang on a minute here. And yeah, we'll get some annotation tools up here, hopefully. Um, so if school starts, let's say it starts on Saturday the 22nd, which I'm pretty sure is what it, what it will start with. What we've decided to do is front load the schedule, guys. Um, the district went back and forth with this several times of, well, should we start with online classes and then as things open up, transition to, to, um, to uh, you know, hands-on classes? And the latest thing they came to us with is they thought that at the beginning of the semester that we will be open for business. That, so we're going to start open. And what they're worried about is as the normal cold and flu season comes in, that they might have to close campus or do other weird things where we, we drop down numbers. So with that, we have front loaded the schedule. So what we'll, you'll see when it comes up is the beginning of the school semester in the fall will be big. Um, so we're gonna have a big start with a lot of classes and then it's gonna taper towards less at the end. So I have more of the five week classes at the, at the beginning. And the thought is, is in case, in case we can't be open at the beginning of the semester, I can always push some of those five week classes towards the end of the semester. Our other proposal overall is to lower the size of our classes to make our max class size to be 18 students max, which is where we were uh, about five or six years ago. Um, we, we our 18 was our max. Oh, I guess now it's longer than that. Now it's 10 years ago because when the recession hit in 2008 is when we went from 18 to 24 to try to take care of the additional students. 
why am I pushing to go back to 18? Well, one, I don't like to see classes be canceled. And I think you guys don't like to see that either if you've ever been in a class that was canceled. Um, the other thing is my strategy in case the virus creeps up again to keep hands-on classes going will be to take these 18 students and cut them into half so that we have classes of nine students. And what we could do is we could do the lecture online just like you and I are, are doing right now and then have one half of the class come from lab for, for one lab day and the other class go in the other lab day. So the class, if it meets two days a week, it's still meeting two days a week, but only half the students are, are attending at any one time. That gives you better social distancing measures. So that's kind of our strategy is to make sure that all the teachers are online ready and capable in case we have to deliver lectures online and to basically chop the classes in half if we need to so that we have less people in the lab at any one, any one moment and can uh, maintain uh, social distancing. I'm sorry guys, I just got a couple more people um, joining in the, um, joining in the thing, so, so welcome. Um, we were just going over the schedule for the fall and like I said, our strategy is going to be to have a big start to the semester. And if something happens, we can take a lot of those classes that are eight weeks or five weeks and we can cram them to the back of the semester. But if everything starts off normal and we are indeed fully open for business at the beginning of the semester, we're gonna wanna try to run as many classes as we can at the start so that if something happens, if cold and flu season comes in and we later on in the semester have to close or have to do some weird strategies, at least we got the bulk of our uh, courses uh, out of the way. All right. What uh, about the students that normally just like float around and help everyone like? Well, we're probably, yeah, we're probably not gonna be able to do that as much. I mean, it really depends, right? Like we're, what we're doing is we're taking our best guess of what things are going to be, okay? Now there is a couple of things that that directly involve uh, you guys in class. Um, and that is originally, oops, I wrote it on Saturday instead of uh, Fridays. Originally on Fridays, we had, we had talked about having AT um, 327, which is the motorsports class. Well, we had to cancel five classes because with all the classes being canceled and the lack of funding for the district. Um, that's what we had to do. They said, you don't have the money to run the 30 some odd automotive classes you were running. You got to cut that number by five. And the powers that be didn't feel like motorsports was a necessary thing. So unfortunately my motorsports class uh, got canceled for you guys. So that's the other reason why I'll be teaching 140 skill and speed on Fridays. The night, the nice thing about that, I know it kind of maybe messes up your schedule. I, yeah, I, I need that for my certificate. <laughs> I know, I know, and I get that. And so what I would ask you to do, those of you guys that really wanted to take the motorsports class. Are you gonna teach in the I need it for the certificate. I would love for you to maybe write, write some, some emails and send those forward to let, to let uh, the Dean know that, hey, these are, these are important, um, these are important classes. Like I, I need these things, right? I, I want to get that certificate. Um, what about the machine program? Is that going okay. to take? No, I'm still, I'm, I'm still working on it. Um, related to related to machine, um, one of the kind of the good things for us is on April um, 27th. Uh, so here in a few weeks, I'm going to go over to Sierra College. And Jennifer and I are going to line up what machines and stuff we want to bring over to AR. So on one yeah. hand, on one hand with the machining program, um, I, we were dealt a serious blow because all of our funding sources to buy new equipment was was cut this semester, guys. Like they basically stopped all purchasing. And so what that meant is the machine program wasn't going to happen because I didn't have the money to buy the equipment. Um, my so Sierra College has really been uh, my lifeline and they're willing to give us a lot of equipment to get our machine program going. So um, 
again, like, so that will give us the tools to put it together. Um, I still am going to need uh, your support. I need you guys as students to let the administration know that, hey, we, if, you know, doing, doing engine blueprinting and machine work, that's something we really want to do. And that there's a demand for that so that they know that this is a real thing and they want to do it. Um, I can only be my own cheerleader so much. And after a while, it looks like I just want to teach that stuff because I like that stuff. So they need to know that other people like that stuff and that there's careers and stuff in that, in that area. So, um, so as it sits right now, um, in the fall, I'm going to teach 140 skill and speed on Fridays. The good thing about that is because I'm teaching 140, not only can we do the normal stuff that we did in 140, but we can have you guys come in and if you want to use the dyno, if you want to do some, some other things that we would have normally done in this class, we can do some of that stuff in the 140 class. And 140 is fun because it, it's mainly lab the entire time. It's mainly time. lab. And that's, again, why I wanted to teach it is because I really wanted to give you guys um, that lab time. So even though we're not doing the motorsports class, um, this kind of gives us some flexibility to, to kind of finish this class up a little better. So uh, that, gives me, that gives me a good question. Um, so for the AT140 class, would we already be enrolled since we're, it would be like basically no. built off of this class? No, you have to, you, you would have to sign up for it. All right. Okay. Um, but what we can, you know, that, that would, allow, once you sign up for it, 140, this course is on a bunch of the automotive certificates and degrees. So you get credit for it and you get to work on uh, projects that maybe you intended to work on on this class and, and other things as well. What I'm going to do with the 140 class, um, my slant on it, is we're going to start every morning and I'm going to just spend a few minutes with you and maybe give you some, some tech tips at the beginning of class. And I might make some um, comments about whatever work was going on in the previous week or what will be going on that week. One question, um, and then and then you guys will work. So it's 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 essentially open lab with a little bit of tech tips here and there, and maybe if a bunch of people have question on a particular topic. Um, so I'll be doing 140. The plan will be with your support, interest, and help to maybe move motorsports, the um, the 327 class to the spring semester and then hopefully get the 350 class going as well because I have that in curriculum and we will have the equipment set up. And maybe if some of you guys help me out or you, or you take AT140, we can spend some time together on 140 setting up the machine equipment from Sierra College so that it is up and running and, and operational um, so that we can use it in the spring. Um, so, uh, questions? Any, any questions on that? So, um, generally speaking, the fall schedule is going to be a lot of classes at the beginning and then taper the less classes towards the end. And that gives us the flexibility if, in case school is not open for hands on classes at the beginning of the semester, then I can push those classes back to the back of the the back of the semester um, but also it gives us the ability if school is open to get get as many classes as we can run early on out of the way in case with the, the start of cold and flu season um, they decide to impose a quarantine or have limited class hours something like that so it gives us a little bit more um, flexibility and that was the best thing that we could come up with based on what we have right now um, I will also be teaching one other class that you guys might be uh, interested in. Um, and I'll put that up on the, on the thing here. So um, engine performance and smog. Smog class. I need that class. Yeah, AT 333. Okay, Chris Moore is gonna be teaching that the first eight weeks um, in the morning. Um, and it goes from eight till noon. Um, 
However, um, he is helping out John McCormick with some um, uh, apprenticeship stuff so he cannot teach his engine performance class. So I'm going to be teaching the engine performance AT332 um, second eight weeks. Again, it's eight, eight to noon. Um, so if you were interested in taking those courses, um, I want to say that uh, 332 is on the motorsport certificate. I know not everybody needs it, but I, I figure some of you guys might. So I'll be teaching that. Um, those classes are in the fall? Those classes are in the fall. Okay. So, I thought that was one class. That's not a one class, smog and... No, not anymore. Uh, Frank, you, you've been around long enough where when you started, it probably was at that time. And okay. then what we did is we split it up into two six unit classes. It was one big 12 unit class and the school district hated that. They don't like 12 unit classes. So then oh. we split it up into two six units. Um, and that's, that's where we're at uh, uh, currently. And, and uh, Chris, the small one is an eight week or is it a full semester? No, it's, it's eight weeks. So it, it okay. goes the, in the mornings, the first eight weeks is Chris Moore for smog. And then the second eight weeks will be me for engine performance. Perfect. So if you guys haven't had smog and engine performance, um, you know, next semester might be a good time for you to, to take those courses and get that stuff um, out of the way. Um, you know, they are, they are important courses. And it, it, it's a little weird if you notice that it seems backwards because this is 332, it's a lower number than this is. Originally, when we wrote it, you took, like back in the days that I taught both of these classes uh, primarily, you took engine performance before you took smog. But when the Bureau of Automotive Repair redid the smog requirements and what was going to be in the cleaner car course or the smog classes we call it, they kind of dumbed down the smog class. So then we flip, flipped them so that the smog class is actually a little bit more basic than the engine performance class. Now when we say engine performance, that's not the same engine performance that we've been talking about in this class. This is engine performance in tuning class, right? This performance here is talking about, well, what systems do we have on the car to have its original performance, right? So it goes heavy into fuel systems, um, fuel systems, ignition systems. Fuel, ignition, um, EFI and all the sensors. Um, that, so that type of thing, you, using scanners. Um, so, and honestly, I, I like teaching this class. I always thought the smog class was kind of a pain because you had to cover the rules and regs and, you know, I, they're important, but they're kind of dry. So anyways, I'm looking forward to it. So next semester I'll be teaching um, uh, skill and speed development and I'll be teaching engine performance um, and still serving as department chair and stuff. Um, we are going to have a little bit less classes. So sign up for stuff as soon as you can. Like I said, we've, we've cut five sections of classes. So, um, and all that comes down to basically budgetary stuff. So anyways, um, let me get these people admitted to the group. All right, so we need to get into our actual um, lessons for today. Now that I, I got to tell you about what's coming down the road and to do that, we're going to open up. Uh, see, uh, we'll open up this one on um, on camshafts first. So, hopefully, you guys can see my presentation now on camshafts. Is that correct? Yep. Awesome. All right. Um, and this is a this is a short one, and that's why I partnered it with the intake systems. But intake and exhaust. Normally I put those two together, but they're way, way too, way too big. So, um, so with 
camshafts, I like to say it's the heart of your engine's tune because by changing that one component, by changing the camshaft, you can change the way the engine um, behaves. You can change it uh, between being more of a low RPM engine to an engine that really wants to uh, climb up in the in the revs by this one by this one um, unit here. So um, we have to get through some camshaft information, um, and that is largely knowing some terms. So the first term I have here is is duration, and duration is just like it says on the screen here, it's the number of degrees of crankshaft rotation for which the valve is lifted off the seat. So this is where people get mix, mixed up is they'll think it's camshaft uh, uh, degrees, but really it's degrees of the crankshaft. So how many degrees did the crankshaft turn when the valve was off at seat? And so when we look at duration, there's two listings that you'll commonly see, and that's total duration or advertised duration, which there's some variance there because it depends on, did they start it at one thousandths of valve lift or 10 thousandths or, so you have the advertised duration and then you have your duration at 50 thousandths. And this duration at 50 thousandths is usually the one you wanna look at because we've set the standard at 50 thousandths of of uh, tap it lift or lifter lift, what that means is that you can then compare one camshaft to another using that duration. All right. Um, so let me keep going here. Um, what I will say is I notice um, there are some questions up on the uh, chat. I think I got everybody rejoined. Yep. And um, I'll, when we finish up today, we'll go back to the schedule and we'll talk about some more of those scheduling type um, issues. Okay, so here we have uh, a typical, really confusing cam diagram. Um, I wanted to show it to you because sometimes you'll see this in books or in documentation. And what it's basically trying to show you is where the valves are open at what time in the, the four stroke cycle, right? So we have after top dead center, um, after bottom dead center, before top dead center. So what's going on there? Now, um, this little slice here in the middle, this would be our, our valve overlap where we have both valves open a little bit at the same time. So some folks like this particular format of the diagram. I find it to be a little bit um, confusing, but there's different ways that you can show this information. Is this in the second part of the book? Did those ever go out? Um, I sent a few out um, and then I just found my wife was my, my shipper uh, post office run and um, I just found like a couple in her car, so I, I have to send those out. But um, remember, I only sent them out to folks that sent me their uh, mailing address. And I only had a handful of people send me their address. Um, I sent so, it. So, okay, so Frank, yours might have been caught, might might have ended up in my trunk and my wife didn't send it. I will look at that again this week and, and get those books sent out. No uh, worries, if you, got if you didn't give me that um, address, make sure you uh, send it to me and I'll get those books over to you. Um, related to that, don't forget I'm opening up, oops, let's see if you guys can see this. New share, I'm gonna switch this to my computer screen real quick. And so hopefully now, you, can you guys see my computer screen and you can see our um, our Canvas web page. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. Um, so uh, if you go over here to modules, I do have the whole uh, digital version of the book.
load it up for you as well. Yeah. But I, I will, I will get those. Yeah. It's, it's, I'll tell you for, for me, I don't know, maybe being an older guy, I like um, reading from a traditional book. Yeah. Um, and it's so. nice the way you, you print them out. It's nice. It's uh, yeah. I like to have the complete set. If you get a chance, if not, it's no problem. All right. Very good. I, I'll, I'll get on that, on that horse there, Frank. So Thank you. Um, let me make sure that I'm sharing the right thing now. So now we should be back to that valve timing diagram, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so with that, uh, let's keep going. So valve overlap, that's where you have both valves open a little bit in the four stroke cycle where we're just finishing up the exhaust stroke and we're starting the intake stroke and both valves are open just a little bit, right? Now, as it says here in the, in the text, if I have a lower amount of valve overlap, I'm going to have an engine that has a nice smooth idle, has good low speed uh, engine operation, good, good torque output. Um, however, that's going to affect me negatively with lower power output at higher engine speeds. So having less overlap is good for the low end of the performance curve, but it hurts you on the high end of the performance curve. All right. Another way to look at the valve timing diagram would be like this. We're looking at the engine as it starts from top dead center, the piston goes to bottom dead center, goes back to top dead center, and basically goes through that, that four stroke cycle, right? Intake, compression, power, and exhaust. And I like this one a little bit better because it, it makes it very obvious where the valve overlap is happening right so you can see that overlap period and you can see you know what's going on with with each valve inside the um inside the four stroke cycle and it reminds you that hey two revolutions of the crankshaft that's 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation to make one four stroke cycle happen okay but in that cycle that the exhaust valve opens up once the intake valve opens up once and that's why the camshaft has to turn at one half of the crankshaft speed. All right, um, so we've looked at that. So we got another camshaft term, okay? And that is lobe center angle. And with lobe center angle, it's a great way to kind of figure out, well, what, what is my valve overlap going to be because you can see by, if we're looking directly down the camshaft, like in this, this diagram, right? Where those two lobes intersect with each other, that's actually where we get that overlap. So the more narrow the center angle is, right? The more, um, the, the smaller the lobe center angle number is. Let's say we drop this from 110 degrees to 90 degrees, well, that would mean that these are closer together. And if I left the same amount of lift there, I would end up with a bigger overlap period, right? So the center angle gets smaller um, when you have more valve overlap. And remember, the more valve overlap I have, the more I'm gonna be a high RPM type of tune from my from my car versus if I have less valve overlap, it's going to naturally want to perform better at lower RPM speeds, right? So that's why matching the camshaft to the other parts of your engine build are pretty critical. All right. Um, we'll get rid of some of these scribbles and we'll keep going. So what do you need to know to to, to select your performance cam. Well, the first thing I have here is, is, is be realistic and know what your goals are. So understand your duration values. And we, we really went over this before, but I guess we can't stress it enough, is that advertised duration 
can vary between camshaft manufacturer to camshaft manufacturer. So it's not a good comparison number. Duration at 50 thousandths of lift is a better one because then I can compare apples to apples because I'm always looking at, well, at this point, it's lifted up the, the uh, lifter by 50 thousandths. So um, stay away from advertised duration and look at duration at 50 thousandths when you're comparing cams one to the other um, is, is the general recommendation. All right, so we're gonna do that. We have two summit camshafts here. And again, this is why we use small block Chevys in the engine classes. Look how cheap those cams are, right? Like it's hard to find uh, parts that cheap for a lot of engines, small block Chevy. They made so many millions of them. There's so many parts available. It can keep the prices pretty low. So what about on a modern 5.3 still pretty reasonable? Pretty, pretty reasonable, um, but not as cheap as the older stuff. The older stuff is still the cheapest, but the modern 5.3s and the various LSs now are coming down in price. And I would say that nowadays the LS series engine is probably the most popular engine for engine swaps these days. Um, so those, those are getting pretty plentiful, but they're still not quite as cheap because there's just not quite as many of them out there. Thank you. All right. Um, so if we look at this, uh, my, my duration example here, uh, one thing that you can um, see here is they give you the advertised duration uh, on both of these. And again, really what you would want to do is click over here for more detail and see, well, what's, what's the, what's the um, duration at that 50 thousandths lift, right? Now it tells you what the total lift is, right? So we got 421 and 444 or 444 and 466. So we can see that this guy definitely has more lift in there than this guy has. And with that, this guy tends to have a little bit more duration, but what's the, what's the duration at 50 thousandths? So if I went to that more uh, information section, what we can see is here's our advertised duration at the 288, uh, uh, but if we do it at, um, at 50 thousandths, that drops that down considerably. And so that's what you would really wanna do so that again, you can compare apples to apples, to apples right? Um, so make sure you look at all these, these specs. Keep in mind that it's really easy. What people tend to do is they tend to get themselves too much camp. They tend to go too big on this duration number, trying to hold up the valves too, too long or trying to keep them opened up too big and it kills a lot of their low speed torque. And so it makes the car not variable, not very drivable if you're driving it on the street. Right, and so um, one thing you really need to do when you're um, selecting a camshaft is, uh, you know, be realistic with your goals. Don't be afraid to get some help. Um, you know, you, you can call the tech guys at Summit. There's uh, Comp Cams has their their phone number. There's, but uh, you know, see what other people are using and, and what do you really want to do with your motor. At the beginning of our class, we talked about how an engine that is that spends, you know, 90% 90, 90 of its time on the racetrack and 10% on the street is totally different than an engine that's going to spend 90% of its time on the street and occasionally go out to the drag strip or go out to the, to the racetrack, right? Those are two different builds. And you're going to be a lot happier with less cam on a on a car that's being street driven. Um, so, don't be afraid to get some get some help. And the common mistake that people tend to make is they try to get too much cam, where they have too much lift, too much duration. Now they have a car that doesn't want to idle. They have to jack the idle speed up to, you know, fifteen hundred RPM. 
Um, it's got no vacuum for the power brake booster. It just, they end up with a car that's not very streetable um, and they, they end up not being very happy with that. So, Professor, yeah, the cans that we just looked at compared to a stock one, it said that the performance one was like 214. What would a stock be the duration around about? Uh, the stock duration for like small block Chevrolet. I'm trying to think of what it is. I, I know the lift is around 270 thousandths because we measure that all the time in the engine class. Um, the duration I want to say is 30, 40 degrees less than what you saw there. Let's go back here. Okay. So pretty significant kind of maybe. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be somewhere, I want to say around like 240, 250, something like that for total duration. Um, definitely a lot less lift. Um, when we look at our stock cams, uh, in the engine class, if I get, uh, if that going is is um, is so it says lift with factory rocker arm ratio. Um, so one, I guess I should make a couple of couple of notes here. This is not the lift at the cam low, right? If I are to if I do my best here to draw the cam low, right? Don't forget that sitting over that guy, he's going to have a lifter. Oops, oh, where am I going there? Here's my lifter. Um, and that's going to transmit its motion up through the rocker arm. And depending upon where I put that rocker arm pivot point will determine how much valve opening I'm going to get on the other end. Right? So when they talk about this lift and they say, oh yeah, that's what the factory rocker arm ratio, that doesn't mean that if I were to take the base circle here and I measured this with my micrometer or my caliper, it's not like if I measured that distance and this distance, I would be measuring 400 uh, and 44 thousandths of lift there. You're taking that lift number and you're multiplying it by the rocker arm ratio, which for small block Chevy is a 1.5 to 1 ratio. So it gives you a little bit more opening at the valve. Anyways, um, with that, normally you're at somewhere around 270 thousandths of lift from a stock stock cam. So this one is definitely um, more a more of a performance build, and you can see when it lock when it when it talks about its description, it says it's got a fair idle. So is it going to idle as well as it did stock? No. Is it going to be able to idle and drive at 600 RPM? Probably not. You're probably going to have to jack that idle speed up to 800, 900 RPM to get it to idle. Um, but it's going to have better low mid-range torque horsepower, but it's not going to be the best at real high RPM, right? I would want something with even more duration and more lift for that stuff. That being said, remember something as simple as you've changed the camshaft. Now I could end up with cam the piston interference issues. So this is where I would want to make sure that my parts clear and I do a test build before I make that make that change. So uh, something like a rock crawler that has really high torque but less power would be something like that example. You would you would want no this 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 cam right here, this is more like your street rod muscle car that you're okay if it has kind of a lopy idle you punch it and it accelerates really good and you're not going to be running it up at seven, 8,000 RPM all the time, right? This is really good for the, you know, three, four, 5,000 RPM, right? That mid range, um, something like a rock crawler, you're probably going to want something with less duration than this so that your, your low end torque is better than what this can would provide. Right. And again, I can't stress enough that when it comes to stuff like this, it's not likely that you're the first um, person to, to try to build an engine for this particular uh, configuration. So I would say, don't be afraid to get some help and talk to the folks, the tech folks and see what they recommend. Let them know what your, what your goals are for your build 
and be realistic, like how much time are you going to street drive this thing versus how much time are you going to be out on the trail, that type of thing, and, or be out at the racetrack and then ha have them help you with what camshaft they, they make that would be the best for that application. All right. Um, once you get that camshaft, if you really want to know what's going on, you should degree that camshaft. And um, it's a pretty straightforward process on one hand. It's also a little bit involved in the other hand. And so what we're going to do is, is we're going to watch a quick um, video here about it and talk a little bit about that. So I'm going to go back to my screen share. I've already queued this guy up. And now you should see the internet window, right? And I'm gonna make that bigger, and let's see how well this uh, see how well this works here. Well, the best way to add power to any engine project is with a cam swap. But just like with a complete engine build, a new cam has to be degreed in. Otherwise, there's just too many things that can go wrong. This is a comp cam. I'll let flat tap at cam I'm installing in a small block shed before an upgrading power. A new cam, lifters, and timing chain means that the cam needs to be degreed in. But you don't have to remove the cylinder heads to do it. Powerhouse Products sells a heads-on cam degreeing kit that includes practically everything you need to degree in a camshaft with the valve train in place. It's an easy process, practically foolproof, and here's how you do it. After you've installed your cam, go ahead and install the timing set. You may need to make adjustments later, but bolting it up all the way, complete with the lock plate, isn't necessary right now. So why don't we do this test in the basic engine... Um, rebuild class, because initially I thought I would do this, and quite frankly, I just would always run out of time to get this done. I do need to make a couple quick notes as we're talking about camshafts. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, that is, this is a flat tap it cam, which means that the lifters are, are just that, the, they're, they're flat that are going to ride on this cam. Uh, however, uh, engines like, Frank, even the one in your Mustang, that's got roller lifters, right? So if you look at your lifter, it's, it's got a little roller on the bottom of it that can spin. That's on the bottom of that um, lifter cup. And so um, you can have, if you have a roller lifter setup, you can have a camshaft that's more aggressive, that has a, a steeper opening ramp that has more lift, uh, more duration, that type of thing. Um, also, why is that a big deal? Because notice that he's putting this weird red goo on there. That's a high pressure camshaft lubricant, right? And that's the real nice expensive stuff um, that he's got there. Uh, in the uh, engine class, we usually use the, the less expensive black colored, almost looks like a grease um, but it's an extreme pressure lubricant. If you're doing a flat tappet cam where the bottom of the lifter is flat, you need to really slather up all these lobes with that extreme pressure lubricant. Otherwise, you're likely to burn up one of these lobes when you start that engine up for the first time and you're breaking in that new camshaft. Take off the hardness on it? Uh, yeah, so... Um, It'll, it'll just it'll wipe that hardness right out of there uh, pretty quickly. And the other thing is you want to have the idle speed up high enough so that it's throwing oil off the crankshaft and lubricating the camshaft. Because the only thing that lubricates these cam lobes, guys, is splash lubrication, little bits of oil that's being thrown off of the crankshaft. That's, there's no pressurized lubrication to the camshaft lobes. There is some to the bearing journal surfaces, so some oil will squirt out from the bearing on the cam lobe, but there's no direct oil pressure lubrication to the camshaft itself. So flat- well, Let's do it, I got some money. Yeah, flat tappet cam is, is um, 
it's really important that you you lube it up like he did here. Now, if you had roller lifters, you could just use engine oil and you wouldn't have to use this extreme extreme pressure lubricant on there. Um, so just a little there's a, on that. Yeah. There's a formula in the chat that Charlie wants you to look at. Okay, let me uh, check it out. It's something that I thought up of uh, last week. Okay. All right. Okay. I see the I see the Turbo Volvo comment. Uh, <laughs> Fifty two eighty top speed divided by weight equals horsepower calculated by weight. I'll have to look at that. Um, you're thinking like um, what's the what's the formula trying to find there? Uh, the um, just power like to ratio? I came, I can't, yeah, like a power to weight ratio kind of thing. But the way I came up with it was thinking of pulling like 33,000 pounds one feet, and that's what I got by weight and how far it goes, kind of thing. Interesting. Yeah, we'll, we'll look at that a little later. All right. Let me. Oh. So let me get the video going again. It, it'll, it'll take just a minute. He's putting in the camshaft and he's gonna degree the camshaft. So to do that, you not only have to have the camshaft in the engine, you're gonna have to at least have number one piston and connecting rod and crankshaft in the engine. And you're gonna have to put the cylinder head on and have a couple of checker valve springs. So although this isn't hard to do, um, and when you know what you're doing, it only takes uh, maybe, maybe uh, 30, 30 minutes or so when you're first trying to do this, you could you could spend a, an, an hour or even two hours doing this. And this is why we tend not to do this particular step in the engine class, um, just because we, we're, we always end up running out of time. All right, here we go. Roger Cam, go ahead and install the timing set. You may need to make adjustments later, but bolting it up all the way complete with the lock plate isn't necessary right now. Install the timing set straight up or with the timing marks pointing toward each other. This timing set from Comp Cams allows me several adjustment options, but the zero mark is plainly visible. If you really want to, you can degree your cam with the real valve springs in place, but the powerhouse kit includes a pair of lightweight checking springs, so I definitely prefer to make the change. The lighter weight springs make the engine easier to spin over, and it also helps you hit specific points with better accuracy. If you don't have a set of push rods that are the correct length, you'll need to use an adjustable checking push rod. If that's the case, you will definitely need to use the lightweight check springs because the adjustable checking push rod can't stand up to the force of a real valve spring and it'll bend. Lots of grease on the end of the lifters can change your readings, so I use only light oil during the process. Afterward, I'll pull the lifters and lubricate them properly. If you're using hydraulic lifters, your standard valve springs will collapse the lifter. So that's another situation where the checking springs are mandatory. Next, follow up with your push rods and rock on. Unlike final assembly, you want to adjust the rocker here so that there's no lash. Any lash in the valve train will throw off your ability to properly read maximum valve width. There are several ways you can attach the degree wheel, but by far the easiest is with a crank socket like this one I got from Powerhouse. The socket has a slot that fits over the crank key, and after it's installed, you can tighten the set screw to take any wiggle out for absolutely precise cam degree measurements. After it's on, a locking collar holds the degree wheel securely in position. Now, bolt the included wire pointer to the front of the engine. One of the water pump bolt holes usually work best. Bend it so that it points over the front of the degree wheel as close as possible without touching it. The included piston stop will help you find TDC, but first use a flashlight to make sure the piston is down in the bore. Piston stop threads into a spark plug hole and extends into the combustion chamber deep enough to limit the full sweep of the piston. By using the piston stop and the degree wheel, it's easy to find top dead center. First, rotate the engine slowly clockwise until the piston contacts the stop. On this engine, the piston contacted the stop at the 124 degree mark. Now, carefully rotate the engine in the opposite direction until it stops again. This time, we get 165. Once you have those two points, you can remove the piston stop to get it out of the way. 
piston top dead center is the midpoint between the two stops, which can be found by averaging the numbers together. The average of 124 and 165 is 144.5, and a half. so we'll go there now. This is your top dead center one. Once the engine is at top dead center, reorient the degree wheel so that the zero is now underneath the wire marker and lock it back down tight once again. Okay, so guys, um, the whole process there, he just wanted, wanted to figure out where top dead center was for cylinder number one, right? So he used the piston stop and basically figured out, oh, the piston stopped this many degrees before top dead center. I went this way and he went the other way, split the difference and figured out where top dead center was. His engine is not completely built. It's definitely not built correctly in that you see that it's, it's missing a camshaft bolt. He's doing a test build, just putting together what he needs to, to degree the camshaft. So he might have the cylinder head on with only two bolts as well. Um, he, he has the lightweight checking springs. He's just in his test build to, to see where the camshaft is at. And if I back this up a little bit here, um, there's a couple of things to note. For instance, remember we were talking about rocker arm ratio a few minutes ago. Um, you, what you'll notice is that these rocker arms are stamped, that they don't have the normal 1.5 to one Chevy rocker arm ratio. They have a 1.52. So these rocker arms will give you just a little bit more lift at your valves. Um, another thing to, uh, to point out is, if I can move it back a little bit more, is that he can adjust, he can adjust when the, uh, the camshaft opens the valves and closes the valves, he can adjust the cam timing by this crank sprocket down here, right? So he's got the, the keyway here is lined up with zero, which corresponds to that zero, which then corresponds to the mark on the camshaft. If he were to choose a different key slot down here, we can see that there's, there's an A1, A2. I can't quite read those other ones, but if he were to select a different one, that would correspond to a different tooth being lined up here and that's basically going to end up either advancing or retarding, right? Backing up the, the camshaft in relationship to the crankshaft. So he can change when the camshaft opens up the valves in relation to the crankshaft by what slot here he chooses to put the keyway on, right? So he can set that adjustment. Now, if he takes the timing cover apart and gets to this whole area again, he can then choose a different slot. It's not, it's not quite as easily adjustable as some other ones. You guys have probably seen, oops, you guys have probably seen some um, cam uh, sprocket designs where there's slots here in the bolt holes where you could loosen those cam lock bolts and move the camshaft back and forth to change the, the cam timing. So that would be a, uh, a little bit more adjustable way to do that, a little bit more easier to get to. But his adjustment, he's working off this, this sprocket here down on the bottom of the, of the crank. All right. Um, Wouldn't it be better just to have gears? To have, to have direct gear to gear? I. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're not going to have the deflection of, of the chain. However, gears tend to be a little bit noisier. So if you think about somebody who's got a gear drive on their engine, it's a good, that's a good point. What they'll have is they'll have, this will be a gear, the camshaft all the gear, and then it has two, um, not drawing them very good, but it's got two intermediate gears right here that are held together with a link. And so it goes gear, gear, gear. Um, anyways, uh, it does give you more precise movement of the camshaft. It tends to be a lot noisier. Um, 
and it, again, it doesn't promote very easy camshaft timing adjustments unless you have some type of adjustment on the on the cam gear itself. So, anyways, um, let me uh, clear these scribbles out of here. We'll get the video back to where it was. I just wanted to let you guys know that yeah, it's not. He's just doing a test build and degreeing the cam, and he wants to select the right spot to um, the right spot to to set up this camshaft. Like what what little keyway groove is he going to select on there? You also notice that these are the same um, turning tools I bought for the engine class because, like I said, I thought we were going to do this in that class, and it just ends up being a little bit too labor intensive, but we do have all the tools at the school to do this check. All right. That reminds me, we still need to put back together engines for the engine repair class in the fall. Yeah, we do. Um, we're gonna be running engine repair first five weeks. And so other than probably your engine that you worked on, I will probably just have those other engines, they'll just take them apart in whatever status that they're at so they can start over fresh or something. Um, all right, here we go. So we'll go there now. This is your top dead center one. Once the engine is at top dead center, reorient the degree wheel so that the zero is now underneath the wire marker and lock it back down tight once again. The last step before you actually begin the greening in the cam is to install the dial indicator on the retainer for the intake valve. The powerhouse kit includes a stand that threads into the valve cover bolt holes and lets you easily position the dial indicator properly. Position the indicator so that it is reading off the top of the spring retainer and then a parallel line with the valve stand. This is critical so you can make sure the dial indicator reads the proper amount of valve travel all the way through its motion. Comp Cams includes a cam card with every camshaft that gives all the important specs, including the intake center line and duration at 50 thousandths of an inch of width. These are the two figures we will use to degree in the cam. If you like, you can also check the intake and exhaust opening and closing points. Checking the duration at 50 thousandths inch load lift is recommended because of slow opening and closing lifts and make it difficult to tell exactly when the valve opens and closes. But since we're measuring at the valve and not directly off the cam lobe, we'll need to take into account the leverage created at the valve by the rocker ratio. We're using comp cams 1.52 to 1 ratio marker, so we'll multiply the 50,000 inch load lift by the rocker ratio to get the actual lift at the valve. That's 76 thousandths of an inch in this case. Rotate the engine slowly clockwise until the indicator shows 76 thousandths of an inch of lift at the valve and look at the degree wheel. Count the degrees from either TDC or BDC, whichever is closer. Bottom dead center is marked as 180 degrees on this wheel, but while checking duration, we'll consider it zero. Since the BDC marker is closer, we'll count up from there and get 42 degrees. Continue rotating the engine through camshaft max lift and stop when the lifter is 76 thousandths of an inch away from closing. If you accidentally go too far, back up beyond your mark and try again. All your measurements should be made with the engine turning clockwise because any slack in the timing chain can throw off your readings if you send the engine backwards. The number we came up for valve close is 17 degrees. To find duration, add your opening number plus your closing number plus 180 degrees. So for this engine, the closing number is 17 plus 42 plus 180, and the result is 239. Checking back against the cam card, comp tells us that the rate of duration at 50,000 inch load lift is 240 degrees. And that one degree of error is realistically inconsequential. With that done, we know the duration is correct for the intake load, but we're not finished quite yet. Next, we want to check the intake center line, and that's just as easy to do. To begin, find the maximum lift of the valve and then zero out your dial indicator on that point. Back up and then roll the engine clockwise until you are 50 thousandths of an inch below maximum valve lift and read the mark on the degree wheel. For this cam, we're at 61 degrees. Now, find the location on the degree wheel at 50 thousandths of an inch after maximum valve lift. We got 145 degrees. To find the intake center line, average those two numbers. Our outcome is 103 degrees, which matches up perfectly with the cam card. And with that, we've confirmed that the intake side of the camshaft matches the manufacturer's specs. 
Most people will be fine here, but if you like, you can go ahead and repeat the process on the exhaust load. But for me at least, I'm going to go back and lock down my timing set and finish my engine build. All right. Um, so let me switch our screen here back to the presentation. All right. And um, so that's what it would be to, you know, degree the camshaft. And it's one of those things where I don't know, you watch the video and it might make partial sense after you do it a couple times, it makes more sense. Basically what you're trying to do is you're testing the camshaft you just bought and you're making sure that it matches what the manufacturer says it matches. And if for whatever reason, maybe the, the sprocket is off one way or the other, and if you could advance it or retard it to line up with their specifications, uh, then you would do that um, and you would know where you were at because you degreed it. You're basically verifying it is where the manufacturer says it is and, and it's installed correctly in, in your engine. That's, that's the process of degreeing the camshaft. So um, does degreeing the camshaft make more power in your engine? Well. Not necessarily. In the case we saw in the video, he didn't have to make any adjustments. So he could have just thrown it together. It would have been just fine. But if he measured it, and let's say the cam was a little bit retarded from where the manufacturer wanted, he could then make an adjustment for that with that adjustable sprocket on the bottom and get it where he wanted it. Typically, when it comes to camshaft timing, and I'll put this in the a text box here, um, if I advance my cam timing, meaning that it's going to open the valve sooner, right? Open valves sooner. Um, that's going to equal more low end power. However, if I'm going to retard my cam timing, means I'm going to open the valves a little later in the four stroke cycle. Well, that's going to equal a little bit better high RPM, right? So if I could advance my camshaft or retard it, it, like if I knew what I was going to do with the engine, that, that might be something I want to do. Let's say I'm building a car for autocross where I'm not getting to do a lot of RPM. It's all about coming off of like tight corners and having good acceleration. Well, I'm probably going to want to advance my cam timing for that application. That, that might end up being a little bit faster setup. But let's say I was going to build like a, a, a Bonneville car, or maybe I'm doing circle track racing where I'm always way up in the RPM. Well, then it may be in that application, retarding the cam timing would be a little bit better deal. And by degreeing the camshaft, then you know exactly exactly where you're at. How do you get the boats in both worlds? Well, that's why uh, factory cars today, they all have variable valve timing, right? That's VVTI right. VVTI or VVTLI. And, and um, anyways, so um, yeah, that's how you're getting the best of both worlds. All right. So... Let's uh, keep moving this thing forward here. Um, and we'll get rid of my scribbles there. Um, so uh, advancing and retarding, as we were just talking about, alters the engine's power band. Advancing the cam improves low RPM power. Retarding the cam improves high RPM power. And what you see in this picture is a modern car with variable valve timing, where it has a cam phaser on the camshaft sprocket using oil controlled from an oil pressure control solenoid, I can vary oil pressure to that cam phaser and basically move it forward or backwards so I can advance the cam or retard it in relationship to the crankshaft in the four stroke cycle and, and try to get the best of both worlds and overall enlarge the power band of the engine. So pretty, pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. All right, um, of course, this allows the timing to shift. We were just talking about that. Um, here's a good shot of Honda's VTEC system. 
VTEC was was a little bit different in that the first VTEC, it wasn't just like having variable valve timing. They actually had a separate lit, uh, a cam profile. So if you look at here in purple, the purple cams here, these are kind of like your low speed, good torque cam profile grinds. You notice it's got less lift, less duration. But in blue, that's your high, high performance cam. So it's got more lift, more duration. And so they would direct oil pressure to this pin that could lock the rocker arms together. So you're either following the low speed cams or you're working off the high speed cam. And so it gave you, like it says, both better fuel economy, low speed operation, and then you could have high RPM power. So it's a pretty neat system. And of course now, if at the end of this camshaft, I also put a cam phaser on there that can vary, vary the valve timing, I'm able to not only change camshaft profiles, but I'm able to change my camshaft timing. And that's what the newer VTEC systems have the ability to do. Very cool stuff. Again, broadens the engine's power band and makes the engine a lot more efficient over the entire RPM range. All right. And it's, it's kind of a fun, uh, fun thing. Does anybody in the class here, do any of you guys have a Honda with VTEC? I do. Okay. So, oh, the, the minivan, right? So, yeah. Hey, that thing, um, it boogies out of all my cars. I like getting it. It's all leather and it. Yeah, it no, I mean, it's, it's amazing how, so what, what we used to do back in the days, and this is, this is early 2000s, like fast and the furious days is you could set up your VTEC solenoid, which is like a manual switch and push the button and manually put your Honda into VTEC. Nice. And it, it was a re it's a really fun experiment because the older systems, it was either on or off. So the, v the VTEC solenoid wasn't pulse width modulated. It was just on or off. So if you turned it on, you were running off the high performance cam and it really would take away low RPM power. You could feel it. And the, but then it would be better on the high RPM. So like you could choose when it came on and uh, it, it was it's pretty fun to mess around with. Uh, <laughs> so anyways. Yeah, you know, and it was kind of reminiscent of having the, the nitrous button. You could wire it up to your steering yeah, wheel. But it, was boost. The, it was the, yeah, it was the VTEC button. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty fun stuff. So, all right. Um, if you have a, a modern car that has VTEC or a variable valve timing, um, what that gives you the ability to do if you have programmable engine management in there is you can program when the VTEC or when the variable valve timing comes on and, and how much camshaft advance do you get and all that type of stuff. So this is a table in, in Haltex software where it's showing like what, how many degrees of advance does the cam have at certain RPM ranges. And so, um, it's kind of hard to see, but what you'll notice is that at your kind of economy range, um, that two, 3,000 RPM, we're given a fair amount of advance. And then at high RPM, we actually go to some, some um, uh, retardation of the cam. We're backing it off a little bit. Um, so that's one thing that you could program in a modern vehicle with programmable uh, fuel injection. So, so pretty neat stuff. Older stuff, remember, we're just going to have to manually figure out what do we want to do with the engine and set it to whatever we want and set it and, and run it. Um, but modern stuff with a couple of keystrokes, you could change when stuff comes on. And so that's, that's one of the nice um, advantages of programmable fuel injection and, and all this type of stuff is it doesn't necessarily going to make more horsepower, right? If I took the time and set the camshaft manually in the right spot and degreed it, um, I could probably make just as much power, but with a couple of keystrokes from the software, I could play around with a lot of things a lot easier. All right. Um, we'll come back and look at some of this stuff from Haltech later on as we get more into using this software. Um, what I want to do now is is uh, switch switch gears here a little bit. 
and we are going to look at our induction systems. And the reason we're looking at induction is because, you know, these things are, are largely related one to the other to the other, right? So depending upon what camshaft you selected, well, that's going to depend on what uh, intake manifold you want with your engine and you really want your parts to match well. Um, so here we have uh, some crazy cobbled up homebrewed intake on a, looks like an old kind of rat rod style pickup truck with a Hemi in it. Um, pretty, pretty radical stuff. Uh, let's see why this guy might think that that's the hot setup for that rig. All right, so the induction system, its job is to provide that correct volume of air fuel mixture to the combustion chambers, right? We're trying to get the right amount of air fuel in there. Um, we want good flow, right? Because the better flow we have going through this thing, the more horsepower potential we have. But we also want to keep the air fuel mixture even, right? Even air fuel mixture so we don't have some cylinders running richer than other cylinders. And we don't want to waste any fuel. So a good intake manifold design is going to promote good combustion by keeping the fuel and air evenly mixed inside the manifold. So we got a lot to do there um, in, our, in our intake system. Well, on our uh, factory cars, right, we commonly will call those guys OEMs or original equipment manufacturers. Well, they got to make sure this whole mess of stuff fits underneath the hood of the car, right? So I can't have some crazy, really high rise intake manifold that's poking through the roof like that, pre that picture we were looking at earlier. We got to make sure that the hood closes we also have noise constraints here so that the air cleaner housing has to be made in such a way that it also dampens the noise. And, and so there's a lot of stuff that they have to keep in mind, um, not to mention emissions laws. We definitely want to make sure that uh, this intake system not only keeps the, uh, the noise levels down, but helps the engine run as clean as it can. And so a lot of these for carbureted engines like this one you see right here have what they call a thermostatic air cleaner uh, where we're going to take some hot under hood air uh, off the exhaust manifold and then direct that to the air cleaner housing to help the, the, the uh, fuel turn to a vapor, especially during cold startup. So there's, there's lots of emission regulations and hood clearance issues that the factory has to deal with that if those aren't our concern, if our concern is only about making maximum power, that we don't have those limitations. Right. So um, the first thing is just air cleaners and the air, air filters themselves. Um, we know that we can uh, get replacement air cleaner housings that, um, oops, all right, I messed up the screen there for a minute. Can you guys see the screen okay, the air cleaners? Yep. Okay, good, thank you. Um, we were talking about these earlier. Remember that these guys do flow more air, but that's because they have bigger holes in the air filter media, right? And they rely on the oil on this filter media to help attract the dirt and keep it from, you know, keep it, keep the dirt from penetrating the filter, right? So these guys are made to work with their, with the oil that's on them. Otherwise, if they are not oiled, they do not filter as effectively. Um, and we also gave you the, the warning about, well, if you have a vehicle with a mass airflow sensor though, if I got a, a vehicle with an MAF, that if I um, over oil it, that can contaminate that mass airflow sensor and I'm gonna need to periodically clean that sensor with the right, with the right product, so. All right. We'll see what's going on here. My computer's having a little, um, how would you um, how would you clean the sensor? 
You would not want to use brake cleaner. Brake cleaner is a little bit too caustic. Uh, they actually make stuff that's mass airflow sensor cleaner that is just um, soft enough where it shouldn't damage those, those um, mass airflow sensors. All right, let's see here if I can. I'm having a, my computer screen's doing something a little bit weird here. Let's see if I can get, oop. I'm running out of, out of computer here, let's see. Okay, give me a minute here. I might have to pause my share as I try to get the computer to catch up because it's not allowing me to um, click anything. There we go. On the screen here, I'm gonna close this out. Go to okay. Um, I apologize, guys. I my computer was acting kind of weird, and I had to switch uh, settings on the um, on the Zoom. So hopefully you, you, right now you can see my entire computer screen. Um, what we'll do is we'll get this, um, get this thing running again. And we're gonna get just the PowerPoint up. There we go. And we will make that bigger and there we go. So um, with your induction systems, right? Uh, what's real popular is not necessarily changing the intake manifold, but changing the air induction system before the intake manifold. And if we can get, if we can get some colder air on there, right? If we can get some colder air, we can make some more power because if I reduce the temperature of the incoming air to the engine by 10 degrees, well, I'm going to, increase my power by a little bit, right? And at first that doesn't sound like a lot. However, if I, you know, redu reduce the temperature by a significant amount, in this case I have a 60 degree reduction of incoming air, well that's a 6% increase in power. So if you multiply that by a 300 horsepower engine, that means you can make substantially an 18 horsepower difference. So cold air definitely makes more, more power. And the colder that air is, the more power that can be made. And that comes down to that, hey, colder air is gonna be denser, which means that there's more oxygen in the air. So as long as I mix the right amount of fuel with that oxygen, I will be making more power because I'll get more heat from combustion, right? So the HCs, that's my fuel. So if I get more oxygen in there, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to make more power. And so a lot of your intake systems are designed around providing you with colder air. Um, there is a precaution for this type of cold air intake that routes the air filter to the very bottom of the car. What would, um, what would that caution be, anybody? You can say it or you type it on the chat. What do you think? What's the danger of running this style? Yep, water. Water, mud, and I actually had um, uh, a, a guy I worked with at the shop had an intake system on his car, very much like this one in the picture, and uh, he did the, the, the Jim Boy's taco run for lunch one day, and... Uh, leaving the parking lot where there was a big dip. It started raining real bad. He sucked a bunch of water up in this intake, hydro locked his block. It sucked all the water right up in the engine. You can't compress a liquid. So it blew the connecting rod right out of the side of, out of his Honda. So um, the downside of this style of intake is sucking water 
in your engine. That's not good for it, and it could cause severe engine damage. All right. What if you put it up high? Uh, if you put it up higher, you wouldn't have the fear of sucking water unless it was uh, raining real hard, it, you know, and it like poured down there. Um, but usually the air will be cooler uh, the lower it is, um, uh, the lower you're, you're scooping it from the car. But you'll see a lot of off-road vehicles will do that exact thing is they'll take this air filter assembly, they'll make a big scoop up high. They'll also usually have some valves in here that are supposed to limit the water's ability to get through the intake where it will just shut the car off before it allows it to suck water in. Um, so they do, they do make those and a lot of those work reasonably well where they have an intermediate plate with a big check valve in here that can stop water flow. It does restrict the total flow a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, so cold air is uh is good right so that's that's one thing and and one thing you'll you'll see um guys do is you might see them take a bunch of ice at the drag strip and i bet uh some people that have sent, spent time at the drag race have seen this maybe nathan's seen guys put a bunch of bags of ice this is supposed to be bags of ice on their on their intake manifolds right if we can keep the manifold cooler we can keep the air going into the engine cooler. Even if we can make the fuel cooler, right? If the fuel is colder and the fuel sprays in the airstream, that again cools the airstream and will make more power. So cold is good um, to a certain amount. So when we get cold enough where the fuel no longer um, atomizes and turns into a vapor, well, then, then, then we've gone too cold. But generally speaking, the colder it is, we'll see. Um, all right, so the intake manifold, uh, there's, it, it provides that passageway between that, that uh, air inlet and carburetor uh, or throttle body uh, to the actual uh, intake ports in your cylinder heads, right? And there's generally two designs on these things. There's what they call dual planes and single planes. What we have in the picture right here is a dual plane design. So let's talk about each one. All right, so a single plane manifold has one large reservoir, as you can see in the middle here, to feed all the cylinders. Right, so we have a large reservoir for the air fuel mixture. That gives us better high RPM uh, operation. It can hurt low speed torque, but we have less mixture reversion issues. We can also have cylinders stealing some mixture from other cylinders. So overall, if my major concern was just making maximum horsepower Right, if that's my, I just want the biggest horsepower numbers I can get, single plane is, is normally gonna be the one that gets me there, okay? And so when you watch episodes of Engine Masters or other similar shows and they're trying to get you big dyno numbers, oftentimes they're running a single plane manifold. One thing you'll notice with this manifold, it's actually raised off the surface of the valleys to try to prevent heat from the engine from creeping up in the manifold. Um, so that's good for making power. It does tend to hurt maybe cold startup and cold drivability because now you have some carburetor icing issues or uh, the fuel vaporization is very poor when the engine is cold. So everything's a trade-off, right? And it depends on what, what do you want your compromise to be, okay? So single plane, one spot for all the, the cylinders to to get their air, air fuel from, better high RPM uh, power is what you typically get. All, all the uh, manifolds are on a single level runner, right? They're all fed together. Um, because of this design, the, um, it's a relatively short 
intake track length, right? So again, it leads to better high RPM power, high volume, um, that higher volume inside the manifold can lower the velocity, lower the speed, right? The speed of the airflow, especially at low RPM. Um, so we have decreased manifold vacuum, right? And, you know, in some ways that could be, lead to less good street drivability. Idling around town, how well do your power brakes work that work off of vacuum, that type of thing. And so they make single plane manifolds of, of various levels to, again, compromise what, what do you want to do with that manifold. So 3,000 to 8,500 RPM is kind of my general rule is that where, that's where these single planes generally are really going to shine is more high up in the RPM curves. You might have some part throttle drivability, some low speed drivability with a large single plane manifold. And because of that, you know, if depending upon it, if you were competing in some form of rate, you know, it might, it might hurt you if, if you're doing part throttle stuff or you're doing lower speed corners, if your RPM ranges aren't right. So again, it's a compromise. So the slow intake charge velocities at lower speeds, because there's more volume there, can get, can create a little bit of hesitation from that. Um, unless you're at, at wide open throttle and at high RPM. Remember, you're, you're typically going to make more horsepower, but you're going to lose some low end drivability with that manifold design. Um, related to this, another thing you're commonly going to see guys use, and you'll see them on those engine shows and stuff, is you'll see intake spacers. And intake spacers, what do they do? Well, they increase the volume of your manifold. They'll increase the plenum volume. What does this do? Well, it allows you to store a little bit more air and fuel in a carbureted application inside the manifold. Um, it gives it a little bit more runner length, right? So if I try to draw this and let's say, here's my intake manifold um, and I move my carburetor up here because now I have this spacer plate there. Well, I've, I've just added a little bit more length here for the air fuel mixture to go. And that's going to give me more time to atomize and turn it into a vapor before it reaches the cylinders. So you could also wrap the intake as well to keep heat oh, away for from temperature. It. Yeah. And there's all kinds of like yeah. ceramic coatings and things that you can do for temperature. Um, so, uh, about the spacers though, what does it do? The added height uh, can uh, improve airflow because we have less pressure reflection. We don't have this hitting the bottom of the manifold and splashing back up that pressure reflection. So that can improve the flow. It can help the atomization. And a lot of times it can help you make more power. So it's something that's very fun to try because it might just be the hot setup for what you're doing in your combination is adding a little bit more plenum volume, adding a, a manifold spacer. Um, however, remember that you start adding a bunch of spacers underneath the carburetor or throttle body. Now you might have hood clearance issues that you have to deal with, right? So spacers are usually cheap enough though. What they might be $20, $30, $15 that you can try a couple different spacers and see what, what works for you. The um, dual plane manifold divides the manifold up into two halves. So the, the, the takeaway is that the manifold looks a little different and you can see that there's two separate chambers uh, inside here. Each plenum half feeds uh, one half of the engine. So what that means is that this guy here, he's gonna feed these cylinders um, over on this side. This guy over here, he's gonna be feeding these cylinders. And so that gives you 
a longer runner length and it helps promote higher air velocities and that's typically going to help your low speed power and torque. So earlier, uh, uh, I think Jonathan commented about um, building like a rock crawler, an engine for that type of application. Well, I would want a dual plane manifold likely for that application. So um, how, do they, how do they line this up? Well, every other cylinder in the firing order uses one plenum. Right, so here's our firing order on our small block Chevy, 18436572. They're gonna group these guys together. Those go to one side of the one side of the engine, right? And then they're going to group the other side together for the other side of the engine. And so that's a 180 degree design, dual plane, right? Two levels, intake manifold. All right, um, like I said, relatively long and narrow runners, increased air vo airflow velocity, right? A fancy way to say speed, right? So the speed of the air is increased at low RPMs and that helps us fill the cylinders better at low RPM. And that's why we tend to have better low RPM power when compared with a single plane. However, these long and narrow runners at some point are going to be airflow restrictions themselves. I can't get the air enough airflow through there. So the air starts stacking up and then I can't get the same amount of total airflow. And that ultimately is going to limit my power, right? So again, it's what do you want to do with this engine? All right. Um, so Dual plane, low speed, good low end torque, good, good vacuum, good throttle response, but at speeds usually around five, 6,000 RPM, this is where the power from a dual plane manifold begins to drop off just because it ends up being more restrictive. All right. So there are some compromises here to try to get the best of both worlds, right? So here we have a high rise dual plane. So what have they done here? Well, they've, they've set this guy up so he's lifted off the valley floor so the heat stays down here. The air stays a little cooler because it's up higher and it increases the um, ram effect by raising that up and it gives you some of the benefits of a single plane with some of the benefits of a dual plane. So that might be the hot setup for what you're looking to do. And those are getting more popular on your, you know, muscle car street rides where you want it to run pretty good, but occasionally you're gonna take it out to the racetrack type of thing. All right, um, reduces the runner angle, more direct path to the intake ports, higher volume. Anytime we start making stuff high rise, whether it's single plane or dual plane, anytime we start going high rise, hood clearance now becomes an issue. All right, and then maximum power. If I want maximum horsepower, well, my hot ticket is going to be, and, and I'm going naturally aspirated, right? My hot ticket is going to be high rise, single plane. So you'll see the guys on the various engine shows when they're running stuff on the dyno and they're trying to make really big horsepower dyno numbers. This is usually what they're going to go to. High rise, single plane manifolds. That's going to give you the ram effect of the air fuel entering the cylinders. You have the length there. You don't have the reflection and reversion. Um, you're going to compromise some low end uh, torque and some throttle response. But hey, if I'm just running this thing at wide open throttle and I'm going to keep it at wide open throttle, well, then that throttle response isn't as much of a factor and I'm trying to make maximum horsepower. That's where this manifold is going to tend to really shine. Okay. 
and then we go to tunnel rams, right? And it's it's more to the extreme, higher higher RPM, more issues with uh, uh, carburetor uh, icing in cold weather and poor fuel atomization. But again, this gives you maximum maximum power. This one here is you can see is set up for two uh, four barrel carburetors, so crazy wicked uh, manifold. Um, designed more for for drag racing doesn't heat the, there's no crossover pack uh, uh, passage there to heat the intake manifold for better cold weather operation. Um, usually requires a minimum idle speed of 1200 RPM just to keep the thing running. Um, so definitely you're, you're really compromised drivability for going fast with this style of manifold. And you're not worried about hood clearance or any, any of that other stuff. Okay, um, so relating the manifolds um, to, to the carburetors, right? Single plane manifolds work better paired with smaller mechanical secondary equipped carburetors. Dual plane manifolds work better when you have maybe a carburetor that's a little bit big and you run in vacuum secondaries. That gives you decent power and good, good drivability. Okay, so um, tunnel ram, you're gonna need a lot of carburetor on that thing to get all the power out of it. So kind of different, um, different strategies with each manifold. Okay, what about multi-carbureted manifolds? Um, here we're looking at a uh, Corvair engine with four, four carburetors on there, which was pretty pretty revolutionary for the day. Uh, multiple carb setups can be uh, very effective. However, they can be pretty difficult to tune and synchronize uh, properly. And so uh, th that, that's the challenge of having multi-carbureted setups, plus the, the, you know, the cost of having all these carburetors on there. But the linkage between them, you know, that it, it all gets, gets a little it's a little ugly there. So um, anyways, it, it can be a challenge to get these to work right, but when they are synchronized correctly and tuned right, they, they can work really well. Um, so different it, multiple carb setups uh, over the years. Uh, the, 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 the classic tri-power was, was pretty, pretty popular, right? You had your, your six pack, right? You had three two barrel carburetors um, again, uh, linkage setups get pretty tricky. Um, when we come back next semester, if you look at um, Jennifer's uh, Thunderbird, unless she's changed it, she, she has a tri-power setup on that with three carburetors and it took hours and hours for her and Trung to get those things synchronized and working correctly. Um, here's a dual carb setup with a couple of Elderbrock four barrels on there. Um, so again, it, you can set these up progressively so that you're primarily running off a of one carburetor and then as you go to wide open throttle, then you're running on both. Um, pretty, neat, uh, pretty neat setup, the costs go up and again, it becomes more difficult to tune sometimes. So um, fuel distribution problems can be an issue. Progressive linkage, I mentioned that. This is probably one of my favorites here because it just looks so radical. The, uh, the cross ram setup. So it gives you a nice long runner length, almost like a high rise manifold, um, but allows you to have lower hood clearance. And it just is wicked looking. So, um, so it's like a tunnel ram with the hood clearance. So that's another variation on that, on that theme. All right. All right, um, individual runner manifolds. Very popular with like running multiple Webers or Macoonies. Um, a lot of your small bore Europeans and Datsuns and different things, import cars did this. Um, and it, you know, th those can work well. Uh, again, getting all the carburetors synchronized correctly and working together as a set can be tricky. Um, at real high RPM, sometimes this can be a problem. 
Um, but you know, on certain engines, this design works works really well. This setup here at high RPM, uh, like I have on the screen there, can be a uh, uh, can lose some power versus having a dual, a good dual four barrel setup. But uh, again, pretty w wicked looking uh, manifold. Okay. And of course, like we started our presentation with today, uh, you can have custom built intake manifolds, uh, which with, that, with whatever you're trying to do there, that uh, look pretty crazy. And you can end up with a car that doesn't even really want to run very well or something that looks cool and you're willing to uh, to uh, deal with how it runs because you're making more power, right? A lot of this stuff though, that you might see with custom stuff, right? It's going to be a lot of trial and error of what's going to work right and what's not going to work right for your engine. All right, so I want to go back to the carburetor spacers because these are probably one of my favorite things to, to play around with in class because you can do a carb spacer change pretty quickly and you can get some different um, results with that, right? So remember that they increase the height and the size of the plenum, right? They're giving you more plenum volume. So sometimes a spacer will give you a similar effect as having a little bit larger carburetor because you have a larger reservoir of air fuel mixture. You're also, remember you have more distance here now to get the air fuel mixture into the engine. Now these spacers can be made of different materials. This one in the picture is phenolic, meaning that it's like a plastic based material uh, versus aluminum. And that's going to help uh, slow the transfer of heat into your carburetor. Um, there's what they call open spacers, like this one here is just an open hole. There's also closed spacers where it has maybe four holes drilled in it for the four barrels of the carburetor. And there's different advantages to each one, um, but it's really hard to say what's going to work best at any one time because there's so many variables, right? What camshaft are you running? What carburetor? What's the intake manifold below it? Um, so these are good to have a couple different ones and to try what's going to work best for you. Keep in mind that even something as simple as a spacer could require you to have to do a carburetor jetting change because you're changing that plenum volume. You're changing that distance between the carburetor and the, the uh, intake valve. So Here's that uh, four hole design. And um, sometimes these aren't as predictable. Sometimes these work really well because they keep the, the air fuel mixture from each barrel separated um, at, versus an open design. And so sometimes they work well and other times they don't. It's, it's really, it's, it's like I said, your best bet is to get a couple different ones and try them out. And you might try it and it doesn't work on one engine and it works really well on a on a different one. So fortunately they're not super expensive and it, it's kind of a fun, um, it's kind of a fun change to do. Um, and keep in mind, especially if you're running carburation, it could result in requiring you to do a jetting change. All right. Um, extrude honing. This is uh, something that's pretty neat. You'll see it done to cylinder head ports, exhaust manifolds, intake, intake manifolds. Um, it's pretty popular if the rules say you have to run a certain manifold or a certain head and you're trying to get the best performance out of that component you can. Um, basically, what, what is extrude honing? You are pushing through a putty or a paste with a bunch of sandpaper grit in it. And that's going to smooth out all the passages and enlarge the, enlarge the ports. And it's, it's pretty darn neat what you can get out of this thing. So just, just for you, Frank, here, here we got our uh, five liter intake manifold and we're pressing the extrude honing through there and it's really gonna smooth out the inside of that manifold. It's gonna open up the passages all a little bit. Um, it doesn't necessarily change the port shape. You'd still have to get in there and grind stuff 
um, but it's going to smooth stuff out and improve flow. So in race series where this is legal, but you have to run a certain manifold, the person that spends the money to do extrude honing is definitely going to have a flow advantage there. So that's, that's what that is. Uh, and like I said, it can be done to cylinder head ports and all kinds of stuff. And you can see the, um, the results there are pretty darn, pretty darn neat. So, all right. Cool. Uh, go ahead. I said cool. Yeah, yeah, pr pretty darn cool stuff. Little, can be a little bit pricey to do, but like I said, if you're trying to get the, the last bit of something and you're limited to running the stock manifold or running a certain spec manifold, um, this would be a way to make the best out of whatever parts you had, right? So pretty interesting stuff. Um, Nathan made the comment earlier, I believe, um, about temperature and wrapping stuff Obviously, you can put thermal coatings on the bottom of your components to try to keep the heat out of stuff as much as possible. That helps things as well. So there's lots of stuff that, that you can do there. All right. Um, so with that, I will clear these drawings and we'll move on. So now you guys know more about uh, manifolds than maybe you ever wanted. Um, but, but there you go. I do tend to think that um, unless you have a really restrictive exhaust, you tend to get more bang for your buck on the intake side than the exhaust side because the pressures are much lower on the intake side. And obviously intake manifolds that only flow uh, or that, that are for carbureted applications where it's flowing both air and fuel um, are a bigger player than just intake manifolds for injected vehicles that are flowing just air, right? So you have more flexibility in a fuel injected application because you're not having, you're not a wet manifold design. You're not having to flow liquid through there. To, um, to wrap all this stuff up, I'm going to throw up some of my, um, meeting controls here. Let's see here. All right. Share. I'm trying to sh get my screen share going again. So give me just a, a second here. I can still see your screen. You can see my screen now. All right, screen sharing has stopped. Now you probably just see my face, Stop right? talking to Mr. Frank. Um, okay, so now what I'm gonna do, is I'm gonna show you this, and we'll just play a couple of videos here real quick to uh, finish things up. Um, so uh, we'll play this one on intake. The intake manifold. Manifold, now wait a minute, let me make sure that this is being shared. Uh, here we go. Share that. All right. Hopefully you guys see an intake manifold on the screen and we will get this thing to play. Yep. Cool. It's yeah, see it. a metal part with several tubular branches, though it can also be made of a special plastic. In carbureted engines, the intake manifold carries the air fuel mixture into the engine. The cross-sectional area of each tube needs to be kept small to maintain the high air speeds that improve vaporization. At the same time, it cannot be too small since that restricts the airflow to the engine at higher speeds. Electronic fuel injected engines with throttle body injection also have intake manifolds that carry air fuel mixture. With multi-point injection, the intake manifolds carry air only so heating of the intake manifold is not needed, and the cross-sectional area of the tubes can be larger. More air can flow, and the engine can produce more power. Fuel is injected into the intake ports of the cylinder head. This cylinder head has intake and exhaust manifolds for a four-cylinder carbureted engine. It is a cross-flow head. That means the intake manifold is on one side, and the exhaust manifold is on the other. 
In many cars, the intake manifold has a mounting for the carburetor and a flange that bolts onto the cylinder head. It has a branch for each cylinder to carry air fuel mixture into the combustion chamber. This intake manifold has a water jacket under the carburetor mounting. Hot coolant from the cooling system flows through the water jacket and heats the manifold. Okay, um, a couple quick notes. Um, a, a cheap way for power, right, is to get rid of this, this hot crossover passage, right? So the video was talking about how they'll run coolant on the bottom of the manifold. Why would they do that? They would do that because it helps turn the fuel from a liquid to a vapor, and that promotes better drivability, especially during the winter time, right? However, most of these, this coolant still flowing through there, even in the middle of the summertime, when maybe you don't need it. And so a way for you to get your intake manifold to run a little bit cooler would be to block this off and that will help keep the whole manifold a little cooler which will keep the air inside a little cooler that can help make you a little bit more power um so that's that's a way to give your, yourself some cheap speed and might be something fun to um to play around with they'll do this even on fuel injected vehicles to help reduce the ability for the, the throttle body to ice over is they might run some coolant lines through the throttle body. So anyways, that's pretty common that you see some coolant ran through the manifold or there's some exhaust crossover in a, in a V8 type engine, something like that. All right, get this thing finishing up. Heating is required in a carbureted engine to provide better vaporization of the air fuel mixture. This fuel injected engine manifold has a plenum chamber that provides a reservoir of air and helps prevent interference with the flow of air between individual branches. It also acts as a silencer. On this primary manifold, the intake pipes are fixed in length. Other kinds of manifolds have extra valves to change the effective pipe length. They're computer controlled by the engine management system to open at a specified engine speed and extend the torque output. Okay, and this is why I wanted to finish today's lecture with, uh, with this little video clip, is that earlier we started off and we were doing camshafts and we talked about VTEC and variable valve timing, where you could get kind of the best of both worlds, but it required, you know, some more sophisticated stuff, some computer controls, well, here we have variable intake tuning, where it's almost like they have two intake manifolds in one, right? They, they can open it up where they have real short runners that flow, flows the air directly to the uh, cylinders. So for high RPM power, that's how the air is gonna flow directly to the cylinders. For low RPM power, Right, for more torque, it's gonna go up and around and over and then get to the cylinders. That's gonna keep air velocities up. So we have the ability to, again, broaden the power curve of the engine over the entire RPM section by having almost two intake manifolds into one. And that's, that's a very common in today's modern cars. And it's, again, something that makes them more powerful but also makes them more efficient because they can basically take the, everything we've talked about manifolds and apply it and, and make two manifolds in one design. Pretty darn neat stuff. And that's something that, again, that's super fun to play around with on your car because um, most of these are controlled with the vacuum valve. And so you can manually control the vacuum to the manifold and control when it switches from one mode to another and if you manually control that, you'll be able to feel the difference. It's, it's pretty fun to, to play around with the variable uh, manifold and, and, and feel the effects of that. All right, we'll finish this quick video clip up. A diesel engine intake manifold carries air only, not fuel. And since no fuel is vaporized in the manifold, it isn't heated. Some diesels use a pneumatic or air-operated governor with a butterfly valve at the entrance to the inlet manifold. This butterfly valve is only used to operate the governor, 
It is not a throttle butterfly valve as seen on gasoline engines. So you got to see a little bit of, of unique stuff on a, on a diesel. Um, but what I was um, excited about really was to, to show you the nice um, clip where it showed you that variable intake manifold with, with long and short runners. So again, modern engines not only combined, um, they not only combined variable valve timing or perhaps variable valve timing and variable lift by having multiple camshafts, multiple cam phasers, but they got variable intakes. So all those things can really broaden out your power curve um, and uh, make the engine more efficient. And that's why today's modern engines can make so much horsepower and still give, give you good, you know, highway fuel economy and stuff. So pretty darn neat stuff. All right, so this week, we, we beat you up with uh, intake manifolds and um, camshafts, and we talked about duration and, and spark, uh, or not, we talked about duration and, and lift and how to degree a camshaft. Um, what, um, let's see here, screen, we'll go that one. What I wanna do is just, um, wrap things up and we can uh, stop the video at this moment and I'll um, go back to our course here. Hopefully that's what this is doing. It's fine that this is going slowly. I'm just giving myself a haircut the entire time. You do, you're giving yourself a haircut. You're, you're a braver man than, than I am. Um, yeah, I, I just, you, you know how I have the like, Pony hawk, the ponytail mohawk. Yeah. Yeah, I just buzzed it off. Right on, right on. Oh my goodness, clear <laughs> all my drawings. Um, all right, so with that, um, we've covered all today's lecture information, camshafts and duration and lift and how to degree a camshaft and intake manifolds. Next week, we're going to go into exhaust uh, systems and how those things work together. We are also going to um, first of all, let me, let me ask, cause I don't see the green bar up. Can you guys see my computer screen? Yep. Awesome. Okay. Yes. Beautiful. All right. So, um, uh, so next week we're, we're going to do exhaust systems and we're going to start to transition to electronic fuel injection. Okay. But the other thing I wanted to show you before we left today is if I go back to our course, and we go to the discussions tab. I started a, a new discussion and I think you guys are gonna like this one. Um, yeah, there we go, published, yeah. All right, so um, unfortunately, although I really like the Engine Masters show, um, it's, uh, it's you have to have a motor trend on demand to watch most of those engine masters episodes. Well, there's another show called engine power that you can watch the episodes for free on Amazon prime. Or um, if you click on this link right here, you can watch the episodes. There is commercials on the link that get a little bit irritating, but they're not, they're not terrible because they're all commercials for car stuff. Um, and these uh there's the one show on netflix uh where it's the sleeper cars versus the supercar yeah I forget what uh, it's is that a That's pretty, a good, pretty good show all right yeah. so what i liked about this particular episode is they run the flow bench and as i've gotten some feedback from you guys you said man the guy from brzezinski his flow bench tests were pretty darn boring well these guys tend to make stuff look way easier than it really is but they are much more entertaining so they'll run a flow bench and then they'll put those heads on the engine and they'll run it on the dyno. And then they even do a little bit of tuning on the dyno. Um, so it, it's kind of fun to kind of fun to watch. So I have three questions for you. What'd you think about the flow bench? What, you know, what was interesting? Um, what was the guy looking for when he was running on the dyno? Um, Cause they go over what they're, what they're actually looking at when they're running the dyno pool and, 
it's a pretty good episode. And in some ways, these guys, even though they, they kind of try to sell you some parts, they also do a better job of explaining what they're doing off the than the engine masters guys do. So there's a TV show I like to watch. Um, it's called Garage Squad. What, uh, what platform or channel is it on? I think it's on the Freeform channel, but I'm not 100% sure, but it's a, it's a really good show, and they, they go to different houses, and they people have, like, these 67 Barracudas, or they have, like, a 69 Camaro that is so oh, old. Oh, I know or, what you're talking about. Yeah, JJ watches it probably. You'll, you'll have yeah, to, I watched a few episodes. You'll have to post that on the, on the discussion about uh, what channel it's on. You could also probably watch, uh, like, the Hoonigan videos on YouTube. The engine power was good. That was good. I like it. Yeah, so, so the nice thing about this one, the reason I want you guys to watch this particular episode is because they do a pretty good job of explaining stuff, and what they're going to do in this episode directly relates to our last three or four weeks of what we've talked about, where they'll, they'll do the flow bench, they'll put it on the dyno, they'll even do some, some tuning on, on, the, on the dyno. So you can get to the episodes a few different ways. You could type in there, Iron Animal Part 2 in Google. You could click on this link. You can watch it for free. If you have internet access, you can watch it. Um, if you happen to have Prime, you can watch it on there. And the advantage on Prime is there'd be no commercials. Watch that thing to make a few comments. I'll be excited to talk to you guys about it next week. Okay. Until then, everybody uh, stay safe and stay healthy. I'm going to go ahead Wait, and stop. One last thing. Yeah. I was, well, I'll stay on the yeah. line. Let me stop the recording here. The formula the that was in the chat. Um, okay. Give me, give me a second here. It's crazy redneck formula. It is a crazy thing though. It's stuff. hilarious. I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I'll tell. You, I'll I'll stop the video recording and then and then I'll and then I'll look at this thing and we'll see if it adds up. Okay. All right. So let's do this uh, we'll over here. Stop recording. I remember we were all talking on the PS4 and.